Before we get started, I just wanted to pray over the message today. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I just want to invite you into this space. I pray that you would just fill the living rooms of people who are watching this right now. I pray that you would meet people through this word. Just hollow me out. That would be a hollow vessel for you to speak through. And I pray that that people would encounter you through this time. Even right where they are in their homes, would they encounter your presence in a significant way. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my church league basketball team was awful. We were atrocious. And just to help you understand how bad we were, the first year I played, we didn't win a single game. Not one. This isn't high school basketball. This is church league basketball. And somehow we couldn't win one game. Now, our entire team decided to come back the following year and give it another go. And that year, we won one game. So then the next year, our entire team came back and we gave it another go. And we won two games. So that's progress. But at some point, you think someone would sit us down and just say, give it up, man. This is not for you. You were not made to play basketball. Give it up. But no one told us that, and we were gluttons for punishment, so we decided to all come back for the fourth year, with the exception of one player that we added to the team, and that person's name was Brian. Now, Brian was awesome. He was deadly from the three-point range. He had some excellent dribbles and handles. He could play, and he knew how to win, and I'm not totally sure why he was on our team. Why would he agree to play for us? Didn't he know how bad we were? I don't know if someone like bribed him or threatened his family. I'm not sure what they had against him that made him play the whole season with us, but he did. And what he inadvertently did is he raised the level of play of the entire team. And for once, we started to believe we could win. So then when we got to the first game of the season, we won the game. I don't know how we won, but we won. And then when we got to the second game of the season, we won that game too. And at that point, we're feeling ourselves a little bit because we just hit our all-time win percentage. And so we're thinking, this year we could win three or four games. But we didn't. We didn't win three or four games. We won every game. We went undefeated and won the championship that year. The same team that couldn't win a single game four years prior is the same team that won them all, with the exception of adding one player to the team who knew how to win. And so we stopped expecting to lose, and we started believing we could win. Sometimes all it takes is one player to swing the odds in your favor. And I just kind of wonder, in your life, where have you felt discouraged and defeated? Where have you felt like it's an automatic loss? Where have you felt like the challenges of life are just too big for you lately? I don't know if for you, it's maybe you're stuck in a dead-end job. It pays the bills, but it feels like you're not going anywhere. And you're glad to have it, but you just feel stuck. Some people, you're thinking, I wish I had a job. I have, I have interviewed so many different places, and I can't seem to get my foot in the door. For some people, maybe COVID has exposed some cracks in your marriage. And you realize it's not so good, and you're not entirely sure how to get it back to good. Or maybe the isolation and the distance has created all kinds of problems for your kids, and they're struggling, and you want to help them, but you don't entirely know how. Maybe you just feel lost. And now that people are starting to come back to church and back to work and back to friend groups, you're trying to figure out, where do I fit in all of this? Or maybe for you. You, you've encountered a tremendous amount of tension in relationships and you don't entirely know how to resolve it. But whatever it may be, the question is, how do you find the courage to believe you can win when deep down you're afraid you're destined to lose? 
Now, thankfully, we're not the only ones who have ever felt that way. We're not the only ones who have ever felt discouraged. Actually, in the scriptures, there's all kinds of stories of people who have felt defeated and felt discouraged. And there's one in particular that you know. I know you know it because most people know this story. It's the story of David and Goliath. Either you heard it as a kid, you heard it as an adult. It's even told outside of the church. It's a story that's widely known. And at this time, In Israel's history, during this story, the Israelites find themselves constantly in conflict with the Philistines. Over and over again, they are in battle with the Philistines. Now, one day, the Philistines had a really ingenious idea. And they thought, we're going to remove all the blacksmiths from Israel. Now, you're thinking, who cares? But the brilliance of it was, is no blacksmiths, no weapons, no swords, no shields, And so when they go to fight against the Israelites, the Israelites are literally defenseless. And so when they go to battle, there is no prayer of Israel defeating the Philistines in that battle. And then to add insult to injury, on top of that, the Philistines have giants in their midst. And there's one in particular named Goliath who decides to come run his mouth to the Israelites. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 4, we see that Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. And Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites, why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion. I am the greatest. But you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you better believe you're going to be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken, just like we would have been. I know I would have been scared. I wouldn't have felt confident about this situation, but they were terrified and deeply shaken. Just imagine a bully getting up in your face every day for 40 straight days. And this is what the Israelites were dealing with. Because for 40 days, Goliath came out with some form of this taunt. And the Israelites knew they couldn't win. Because the closest thing Israel had to a giant was a guy who was six foot something. He was six foot tall, and his name was King Saul. Now, we think about David and Goliath, but the one person who was actually qualified to go fight Goliath that day was the king of Israel, King Saul. And yet at that moment, he is deeply shaken. He is terrified. And part of the reason for that is because his relationship with God was at an all-time low. He had been disobedient on multiple occasions, so much so that God said about Saul that it grieved him that he had made him king. Matter of fact, even to the point where he rejected Saul as king, Saul didn't even know, but God had already appointed his replacement. And that that replacement was David, a teenage boy who he had anointed king. And so at this point, Saul doesn't have a whole lot of like spiritual strength because literally the spirit of God left Saul and went to be with David. So you can imagine why he would be terrified. He is just functioning out of his own strength. He's functioning out of his own power. And when the biggest dude in all of Israel is terrified, shaking in his boots, then everyone is terrified. Because you don't have a prayer. So then we kind of have to push pause, though. And we have to turn our attention to David, the other key figure in the story. Now, like I said, David had been anointed king. And just a few uh, moments before this story, not too long ago, the prophet Samuel had visited David and his family. David had eight older brothers, and he had a father named Jesse. And so the prophet Samuel came to their household to anoint the future king. And he looked at all eight of David's brothers and said, they ain't it. And then eventually when he got to David, God said, this is the guy. Anoint him king. And so they did. And the next thing we read about in this story is not David ascending to the throne. 
what we see is David going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, taking care of the sheep because he was a shepherd and running errands for his father. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm David, I'm not running errands for my father. Have one of my loser brothers do it for me. They didn't make it as king. Make them do it. I have potential in life. But so then David's dad calls him in and he essentially says, hey, I need you to take food to your brothers. Because his three oldest brothers were actually in Saul's army and they were facing Goliath at this point in the story. And he says, I need you to go take some food to your brothers. And I need you to bring back word about how they're doing. So I'm also David, if I'm David, I'm thinking, how did I get demoted from future king of Israel to pizza delivery boy? How did this happen? Why am I doing all this? Because I certainly wouldn't want to. But this gives us a glimpse into David's heart. Even though he had been anointed the future king of Israel, he was still faithful in the little things. He was serving his family like it was just any other day. Because to David, it was Tuesday. It wasn't the day he was going to defeat a giant. It was just another day. And yet he was faithful to love his family and to serve them. And as a result, he unknowingly positioned himself to be used by God in a mighty way that day. And so when he arrived at the battlefield and he heard this giant mouthing off, the difference was is David wasn't afraid like everyone else. He wasn't deeply shaken and terrified. He was angry. And he resolved in his heart that he was going to shut this dude up. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Then he repeated, they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking to the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. And David responds and says, now what have I done? What's your problem, guy? Can't I even talk to my friends? And then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. So when David was anointed to be king, if you know the story, do you happen to know who didn't get anointed king that day? It was Eliab, David's big brother. Now, as a big brother myself, we think we have the corner market on authority. We always want the best things. We always want to be in charge. That's the way it goes. And so when your baby brother is anointed king over you, that's not cool. So Eliab is angry over the fact that he got snubbed for the opportunity. And the thing that's interesting is when we're snubbed for opportunities, it shows us a lot of what's going on inside of our hearts. And what we saw in Eliab's heart as a result of being snubbed is a lot of pride, a lot of resentment, and a lot of jealousy. And so he takes a swipe at his brother's character. And he says, I know how conceited you are. I know how wicked your heart is, which is almost laughable. Like every time I read it, I think, wait a second. Wasn't David chosen to be king because of his heart? Like, so the prophet Samuel, when he first saw Eliab, he thought, this is the guy. This is the future king. He looks kingly. And yet God said to him, he ain't it. And so he gets all the way to David. And and, uh, God tells the prophet Samuel, don't look at his outward appearance. Don't judge the way that everyone else judges. Because God judges the heart. And that's why David was chosen was because of his heart. And yet in this moment, he was attacked for the very thing that was true about him. It actually teaches me that attacks against our character often try to twist what's actually true about us so that we buy into the lie. Attacks against our character often try to twist what's actually true about us so that we buy into the lie. Now, thankfully, David knew what was true about himself. He knew that he was chosen to be the future king of Israel. 
And so he didn't need to defend himself. He didn't need to say to his big brother, Nuh-uh, God loves my heart. Matter of fact, you're stupid and you're ugly. You're clearly not king material and no one likes you anyways. He didn't need to say any of that because he knew who he was. He was secure in the fact that God had chosen him to be king because of his heart. And so he could just simply walk away. He deep down knew that this wasn't about Eliab. The fight wasn't with his big brother. The fight was with the giant. Now, I'm guessing that just the fact that David is asking about the reward was enough to get him the attention of the king. I don't know if that's because no one else wanted that because everyone, everyone else is freaked out, so no one's asking about the reward. So someone who does, they're thinking, maybe this is the guy. So they bring David to King Saul. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 31, David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul said. Now we would all say the same thing. You're dumb. Don't be ridiculous. You don't stand a prayer against this guy. But so Saul continued on and said, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that statement. I'm glad you've been taking care of the sheep. I'm not sure I want to send you to war. But then he says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. That might be the most hardcore thing I have ever read. He said, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. He's not talking about a squirrel. He's talking about lions and bears. I don't know how you respond when faced with a lion or a bear. I know for me that my lifelong goal is to wrestle a bear to the ground with my bare hands. But that's me. I don't expect you to feel the same way. At this point, I'm kind of convinced. Go on, David. You've been clubbing bears and lions? I think you can take this guy. (laughs) But so what's interesting is, again, we see a snapshot of David's heart. He had complete confidence in God's ability to help him defeat the giant because of all the ways that God had been there for him with with the lions and the bears. Or to put it another way, God's past faithfulness gave David confidence in his future deliverance. And really, to David, Goliath was just another wild animal attacking God's flock. But what's interesting is David is a teenager at this point, no more than 16 or 17 years old. And yet he had more courage to face this giant than the reigning king of Israel. And if I'm Saul at this point, it's a wake-up call. I'm thinking, this kid has way more confidence in God than I do. I need to, like, fix my life. My life is off at this point. Because what king is willing to send a teenager off to fight a giant and expects him to die in the process? That's like sending Svea Taylor out to go fight a giant. That would not be a good decision. I would not feel good about that. Who does that? Well, King Saul, actually. Because in 1 Samuel 17, verse 37, we see that Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, and the Lord be with you. That's one of those platitudes that we don't actually mean. But what's interesting is the Lord was with David, and it wasn't with Saul. So then he gave David his own armor. He gave him a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. And David put it on, strapped a sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. Because he was a shepherd, not a soldier. He said, I can't go in these. I'm not used to them. So David took them all off. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed with only his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now remember, Saul is the tallest guy in Israel. He's six foot something. And he's trying to give his armor to a teenager who is not six foot something. 
It's comical. Why would you do that? Like the guy has like lost his mind or something. Maybe it's, he doesn't know what else to do. He feels like if you're going to go to war, maybe you should be dressed for it. But it's an important thing for us to just take to heart is that we were never designed to wear someone else's armor. We were never meant to be just like someone else. David had to be true to who he was. He was a shepherd, not a soldier. He might not, he might not have had any experience with a sword, but he was a dead shot with a sling and stone. He had to be who God made him to be. And so he picked up five smooth stones. He, he grabbed his shepherd bag and his sling, and he went off to kill himself a giant man. And in 1 Samuel 17, 41, we get to see the account. So Goliath walked out towards David with a shield bearer in front of him, which is interesting. So Goliath is nine foot tall. He is wearing 125 pounds of armor, and he has someone in front of him with a giant shield. How much more do you need? I don't want to face this guy. But so he steps out with all this and he's sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. And he says, am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Get over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine with maybe the dopest speech I have ever read in my entire life. He says, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Ooh, I'm ready to fight now. That's so good. The confidence is just all in that speech. But Goliath is not impressed because he starts to move closer to attack. And then David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and stone, for he had no sword. Remember, there wasn't a whole lot of swords to begin with in Israel, but he didn't even need one. So then David ran over and pulled out Goliath's sword from its sheath, and he used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran, and boy, they better run, because David is about to bring some vengeance. You better run. Now, I've read this story so many times, and I don't know if you've ever watched a movie and got to the end of it and thought, I'm not totally sure what just happened here, and then you watched it again, and you're like, oh, I didn't think that's actually what this movie was about. It's like every Christopher Nolan film for me is like that, especially Tenet. I watched Tenet and thought, I do not understand what this movie's about. I'm going to have to watch it three or four more times. That's kind of how I felt about this story, is I've read it so many times. So many times and I thought, oh, it's, it's because he was trained as a shepherd with the stone and the sling. And, and so he was trained to fight the bears. And so as a result of that, he was prepared to take down this giant. But it's not about the sling. It's not about the stone. It's not about his shepherd's staff, his real secret weapon, the one that no one else in Israel had, was his confidence in the Lord. Yeah. He was the one person who was confident and who God was. And matter of fact, even when he speaks to the giant, I hear like remnants of Deuteronomy 20 verses 1 through 4. And it says, when you go out to fight your enemies and you face horses and chariots and an army greater than your own, do not be afraid. Don't lose heart or panic or tremble because of them. For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies and he will give you victory. So when David is faced with an enemy that is too big for him, it's greater than him. He's not intimidated. He's not afraid because he's full of faith and confidence in the Lord. 
Saul risked the entire fate of Israel by sending this boy out to fight a giant. And it wasn't because he had faith that God was in it. David was the one person who seemed to remember what Saul and Israel couldn't seem to remember, which is that victory ultimately comes from the Lord. Goliath may have been the Philistine champion. But Israel actually had a champion on their side that was bigger and badder than him. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't David. It was the Lord. In this contest of champions where one person would represent the entire nation, they may have had Goliath who was their Philistine champion, but Israel had God who was their champion. Or to bring it out of the Old Testament into the New Jesus is the reigning, undefeated champion of the world. And victory is always his. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, we see that we endure by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Jesus is the champion who fights on our behalf in the contest of champions. Now, this word champion is used in relationship to both Goliath and Jesus. The difference is, in Goliath's case, the word champion just simply means representative. He is representing the Philistines. But in Jesus' case, the word champion means pioneer, which means that he doesn't just win victory for himself. It means that he teaches us to experience victory. He goes before us so we can follow in his footsteps. Jesus is the one who gives us the confidence to stand up to the giants in our lives. And so your giant might be bigger than you, but it will never be bigger than Jesus. Pastor Louis Giglio says this. He says, Jesus is the David. Jesus is David in the story of David and Goliath. Jesus is the giant killer. Jesus fights the battles for us. Jesus stares down the face of impossible odds. Jesus takes up his sling. Jesus selects five smooth stones. And Jesus takes aim at the giant. The giant falls because of the work of Jesus. See, we all think when we read this story about David and Goliath, we all think that we're David. Now, if that's true, and look, I'm, I'm right there with you. I always think I'm David. I love David. But if we're David, and then we try to step up to a giant, no wonder we lose. Because at the end of the day, we don't have in ourselves what we need to bring down the giant. But if Jesus is David, if Jesus is this guy in the story, then we might actually have a shot. We might actually be able to win. Because Jesus is the giant killer. He empowers us to slay the giants in our lives. And in my own life, Jesus has empowered me to slay a variety of different giants. I remember as a younger man struggling with lust and feeling I could never find freedom from it. I would literally wake up in the morning and look at my face in the mirror and just be ashamed. I thought there was no way out. And yet Jesus empowered me to kill that giant in my life once and for all and live a pure life. And I've lived a pure life ever since because he gave me the strength I needed. But then also there was another giant in my life, which is this lie that says you'll never be good enough. No matter how much you succeed, no matter how much you do, you will never measure up. You will never be good enough. And I haven't completely killed this giant, but I am working on killing this giant every day through the power of Jesus. But then there was also this other giant in my life who year after year stood taunting me, typically around my birthday, just telling me, you will never get married. It'll never happen for you. You're unlovable. No one will ever love you. And it took me a minute. It took a bit. But in the power of Jesus, I have killed this giant. Jesus is the giant killer. 
With Jesus, you can kill the giant of anger and bitterness that has controlled you. With Jesus, you can kill the giant of insecurity that leaves you uncertain of your worth. With Jesus, you can kill the giant of addiction that has wrecked every one of your relationships. With Jesus, you can kill the giant of unforgiveness that has poisoned your soul. Jesus is the one who swings the odds in your favor. No matter how hopeless you may feel, how discouraged you may feel, your giants might be bigger than you, but they will never be bigger than Jesus. Jesus is the champion who will never fail you. He is undefeated in battle. He never loses. He always wins. But so the question is, is what giants have been staring you down lately? Where has defeat gotten stuck in your heart? Maybe you've just accepted that you have to put up with this giant forever. That you just have to deal with the problems you're facing down forever. But you don't tolerate giants. If you do, they'll take over everything. They'll take over your entire life. You don't tolerate giants. You kill them. No matter how many times your giant has defeated you. And I'm sure it's been discouraging to encounter defeat after defeat. But no matter how many times your giant has defeated you, it can never, ever defeat Jesus. He is the champion. He's the pioneer who teaches us how to be giant killers. He's the one who empowers us to kill the giants in our lives. I mean, just imagine for a moment If we believe this was true, just imagine how different our our world would be, how different our country would be. If the believers of God actually believed that Jesus was the champion, that victory was his, that we didn't have to put up with giants anymore. Imagine how that would change our world if we were filled with people with faith and confidence that Jesus is who he says he is and he is bigger than any challenge we may face. I was thinking about this. How many songs have been written and released about victory lately? How many sermons have you heard about victory lately? Maybe part of the reason is is because we as a people need some hope. We've encountered all kinds of challenges that feel so big and unanswerable that we just need some hope that victory is possible. And maybe we're all feeling that. And maybe today we just need encouragement that victory comes from the Lord. Yeah, that's right. But it's also why the victory in your life is so important. That when the giants fall in your life, that you're able to share that with other people. Because when you see the giants fall in your life, it doesn't just have implications for you. It also places hope in the hearts of others. Your testimony gives other people confidence and hope that maybe, just maybe, it could be true for them too. David was the one person in all of Israel with the courage to stand up to a giant. No one else believed it was even possible. They were shaken in their boots but he wasn't intimidated by Goliath because his eyes were locked onto God. He wasn't even fighting for himself. He was fighting. He wasn't even fighting for Israel. He was fighting for God's honor because he had his eyes locked on who God was. And he believed that God was bigger and badder than this giant in front of him. And as a result, he won the battle that day. But it wasn't just a victory for David in the present. It was also a victory for David in the future. So later on in life when David was actually king and he'd gotten older and he couldn't fight giants like he used to as a teenager. Thankfully, he had inspired an army of giant killers who could step in and handle business on his behalf. There's this story in 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 through 22. And I just want to summarize it for you. But essentially, Israel and the Philistines are at war again. But this time, David, the king, is in the midst of the battle with his men. And he is fighting. And at one point, he gets cornered by a giant. And this giant nearly kills him. But thankfully, his soldier Abishai comes in and rescues him and kills the giant. 
And then you read about a series of skirmishes between giants and David's men. And it's all different guys. At one point, it's Sibachai who takes out a giant. And then the next time, it's Elhanan who takes out the brother of Goliath. And then the, the fourth time, it's David's nephew, Jonathan, who kills a giant with six fingers and six toes. But every time, it's a different person. And what I love about this story is that David had inspired an army of giant killers. It wasn't just him anymore. There were other people who believed they could do it. And in 2 Samuel 21, verse 22, what we see is that these four Philistines were descendants of the giants of Gath. But David and his warriors killed them. It's great to be able to kill giants for yourself. But isn't it better when you can teach other people to kill giants in their own lives? As a teenager, David set the example for how to trust God for victory. But later in life, he had to depend on other people to fight the giants for him. And the thing that I love about this is it just takes one person. It just takes one person with the courage to face down their giants to inspire an army of giant killers. It just takes one person with the courage to face down their giants to inspire other people to believe it's possible for them. It just takes one person. Maybe that person could be you. So today, would you be willing to remember the promise from Deuteronomy 20 that the Lord fights for you and that he will bring you victory? Will you face your giant down, not with your own bravado, not with your own strength, but with faith and confidence that the Lord is on your side and that the Lord is the giant killer who fights on your behalf. Will you place your eyes on Jesus every day this coming week in the scriptures, through prayer, and in worship? And every time you feel intimidated by a challenge or a giant in your life, would you just simply say to your giant, you might be bigger than me, but you will never be bigger than Jesus because if you will if you will place your confidence in the Lord I believe the Lord will honor your faith all that we ask is that we trust him that we cling to his word we build our lives upon his promises and that we have the courage to face down every giant in our lives not in our own strength but through the power through the strength of the giant killer known as Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are undefeated in battle. We thank you that you have never lost a battle. And today our confidence is in you. In every place in our life that has felt, that has felt impossible, in every place where we feel destined to lose, we choose to trust in you again. We choose to place our hope and our faith and our trust in you again. God, you are good. You are the giant killer. And we don't have to simply put up with giants in our lives. We can kill them all. And so, Jesus, I pray that today there would be an emboldening of your people. There would be a strengthening of your people. That right there in the middle of their living rooms, that you would strengthen your people to find victory that they have been hoping and praying for. God, raise up your people to be an army of giant killers. I pray that you would open doors of opportunity for people to share their testimonies of how you've been faithful and how you've showed up. God, I pray for victory in every household and in every person's life that is listening to this today. You would bring certain victory into their lives. Now, I know for some people, you've heard me talk a lot about Jesus and you haven't actually made the decision to accept him as Lord and Savior. And I just want to give you an opportunity because today is the day. Not tomorrow, not a week from now, not when everything is right in your life. Today is your opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and champion. Scripture says that if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. And so I just want to invite you to repeat this prayer after me. Pray this prayer with sincerity of heart, with all the faith that's in your heart, and you will be a different person today. Pray this after me. Father, I give my life to you. 
Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me, forgive me. Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, serve you, and follow you. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.